<clears throat> so what I've preached has been very discombobulated the last two days. I think the image that is sticking with me at the moment are two parts of this scripture. The first part is that this scripture is at a crossroads. That when Philip, who, if you want to know who he is, he isn't Philip, one of the disciples, Philip. He is Philip, one of the people chosen to be a deacon by those first disciples because they needed more help. So this Philip has been charged with taking care of the widows and the orphans to bring prayer and food to people. But God has a different plan for Philip. And so God sends the Spirit to tell Philip to go to this spot in the road. Now how many of you listen to God when God says go? How many of you have let God tell you where you need to be? Philip did. He went to that spot, and this isn't a place you're going to choose to be. Remember when I told you the story about the Samaritan last week? This is those roads. They're in the hill country. They're dangerous. You don't go there unless you have a purpose and are getting somewhere. And yet that's where Philip is being directed to go by God. And as he's there, a chariot comes up. Now, remember, most of the disciples and the deacons, the early apostles, aren't from the class that rides in chariots, right? They're lucky if they have a donkey. But there he is at that crossroad. And God says to him, Go up to the chariot and speak to the man. He has a choice he can make there, right, at that crossroad. Will he approach someone who has a chariot, meaning he's got lots of money, probably has weapons, is in a different class and position than Philip? And is a different color than Philip? He's in Ethiopia. Will he make that choice to go and do what God asks? When Philip decides to choose what God has provided for him, he goes up to that chariot and encounters the man in the chariot an Ethiopian eunuch. Now I'll let the parents describe what that is. What I will say about it is that that's not the, what the word actually means in the New Testament. The word is the word used to describe people who don't fit in the normal categories of gender. Meaning, it could be that you can't have children. It could mean that you are homosexual, you're gay. It could mean that you're transgendered. That that word is much richer than the word that the Bible translates it into. But those people in this category of gender variation, of expressions outside the norm, have been used in this society to have a special role in place. So he's chosen by Candace to be his treasurer because she knows he's not going to have a family and take that money and steal it, okay? That's why he's in that position. But here's an interesting thing to think about. Why is he coming from Jerusalem heading back to Ethiopia? So there's an interesting biblical discussion about whether he is Christian, whether he is Jewish, or whether he is whatever Ethiopia practices at the time. And part of that 
discussion has to do with this relationship that was created with the Queen of Ethiopia during King Solomon's reign, where they were given um, the, the Torah as a gift. And so there were conversions of Ethiopians to Judaism in that period of time. But this eunuch, this Ethiopian, even if he converted to Judaism and was in Jerusalem to present himself at the temple, he would have been denied entrance. He would have not been accepted because of his gender variation. He would not have been allowed inside the temple. And so there in the chariot, he is reading the text, the scripture. And Philip hears what he is reading. And he's reading a passage about the suffering servant. And the man asks Philip, well, Philip asks the man, do you know what that means? And the man says back to him, how can I know what it means if nobody will talk to me about it? Which is one of the reasons they argue that even though he was a convert to Judaism, he may not have been allowed inside the temple to actually learn about the faith. And so Philip starts to talk to him about what that passage of scripture means to him. He starts telling him about Jesus. He starts explaining the gospel to this man in the chariot. And as he's explaining the gospel and they're driving along, the Ethiopian sees a body of water. Now he's heard the whole gospel story. He knows the importance of baptism. And he says and asks Philip, can I be baptized in that water? And Philip, who is also Jewish, but has now embodied what it means to be an early Christian, takes that man. That man whose gender is problematic, that man who is of a different race, that man who should not be allowed in the church. He takes that man into the water and baptizes him. The kingdom of God is expanded at that crossroads. They chose a different path. They chose a path that said you are welcome into the body of Christ. That you are part of this new community that we are building. That your sexuality, your gender identity, is not important to your place in God's world. Philip changed that day how we are to think about people who are different from us, maybe the same as us. People who have different gender identities, they are invited into the kingdom. And in that moment, this is my favorite part of the story, the Holy Spirit wishes Philip up and he flies to the next town. It's like a superhero story. But what I've been struck with is two points in the scripture this week. One is that phrase, justice was denied him. It's the one that I've been sitting with all week, right? Because the week began with us learning that our Miranda rights were taken away. So what does that mean for you? If a police officer stops you now, they do not have to tell you your rights. So what are your options? Don't speak. Ask for a lawyer because they are no longer required to tell you what you have available to you. And you can no longer sue them for not telling you. 
They decided that the 13th and 14th Amendments are not important anymore. And as if that wasn't enough, that day they decided that if the death penalty method that was available to you was inhumane, you had no say in it whatsoever. And if that wasn't enough, they made more decisions this week. And the one that has UCC pastors and all my friends upset, as if Miranda and the death penalty weren't enough, was that they decided that women are not human this week. That women don't have the right to all of the rights and responsibilities that everybody else in the country has. Justice was denied them. Those are the words that I keep hearing, right? Because I think about my last confirmation class that I had in Wisconsin. Three young women. So if my son is 26, that makes them 20? Entering college in Wisconsin. In a place where when you go to college, you explore. You do all those things your parents told you not to do. You do them to different degrees, but let's face it, we all did it, right? They're 20 in a state where they now can face all sorts of unintended consequences for actions that they may not have had any control over. I think about those girls. Those girls who touched my life, who made me laugh and cry as they shared their faith with me. And their lives have been transformed in a way that seems unfair. I think about my grandmother, who lived in Connecticut before the case that the Justice Thomas wants to overturn next, before Griswold in Connecticut was decided. And in the last years of your life, your grandparents tell you the things that are important to you. Meaning that you hear the same story over and over and over again because they want to make sure that you get the point of the story. So the story that grandma told me in those last years of her life, the story that she told me every time the mail came and there was a request for money from Planned Parenthood, the story she told me was about my aunt. And about my aunt needing birth control and my grandmother, who never liked to drive very far away, who stayed in her little spot in Connecticut, shopped at the stores right uptown, my grandmother got in the car and drove two hours to New York so that my aunt would not have to get pregnant until she was. And so every time that letter from Planned Parenthood came, she says, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing it for your aunt. I'm making sure that no woman has to go through what I did, having to have seven kids and multiple miscarriages. I want you to have a choice. So that's one of the people I'm thinking about this week. I'm thinking about my best friend, Carol. We were in graduate school in Connecticut, and this is the late 80s, early 90s, at a time when we were pretty sure that Ronald Reagan was gonna take away our rights, but he didn't. But there were big protests, and we were in Connecticut, which meant we were only two hours away from Washington, D.C., so we got on bus. The Women's Studies Department had bus that took us to Washington, D.C., where I heard Holly Mir sing, We Are a Gentle, Angry People. 
where I heard people talk about what it was like to live without options. And I think about me, my mother, and sister among us, four live births, four miscarriages that required DNCs, one abortion. And that is just me, my mom, and sister. How many people have told you their stories? How many haven't told you their stories? Because they were ashamed or fearful. Justice was denied them. That's the words that have been in my heart this last two days. How do we talk about what it means to practice justice? To practice a belief that everyone is human and everyone deserves a place at the table, a right to autonomy. Everyone deserves, like that book that I read about God's dream, to be that inside self that God created, that wonder and hope and possibility. justice was denied them. Because you know what happens this week, right? On Monday or Tuesday, the final decision comes in and it says that the EPA will no longer have the power to regulate. That means climate change in the United States is over. Justice is denied them. But God is a God of hope and possibility. That when justice is denied, God sends the Philip into your midst to tell you what the gospel is about. That God, if you are the Philip, picks you up and takes you to the place you need to be so you can speak about God's justice and hope. About everybody's welcome in the kingdom. About the importance of looking beyond those things that we have decided need to keep us apart and seeing that creation, that imago dei, that understanding that God has created us in all our difference to be loved, to be valued. And our job, if Philip has plopped out in your midst, to argue about justice being denied. To become a safe haven for those who need a place. Because I think about what my original thoughts were. That right now, to be trans in the United States is to be in danger. It's to be a class of people that have the highest rate of murder amongst them, of teenagers who have the highest rate of suicide, and to have laws being passed to demonize them. Justice denied them. And yet God looked at that Ethiopian eunuch that man in all his gender variety and believed that he could hear the gospel, that he could be accepted into those waters of baptism and become the founder of the Ethiopian Christian church, a church that exists to this day. That that man, that man baptized in that water transformed the Ethiopian community, brought the gospel to a new place. He wasn't asked to become something different. He was asked to become more fully himself, to be washed with those waters and brought into the kingdom. And that's our job. To be the place when justice is denied, 
that offers hope and possibility and promise. To be the people that welcome those who are different from us. To be the people that share that the rainbow colors that God has created are so wonderful, so beautiful, that our job is to make those colors shine. Amen.